So welcome uh, to my talk. This talk will uh, give you a short preview of a quite long article that we wrote uh, on this book, on general relativity, uh, which is, uh, in fact, the proceeding of uh, the conf Minkowski Conference, the fourth international conference on the nature and ontology of space-time, uh, organized by the Minkowski Institute. Uh, last year, where uh, we presented uh, uh, this talk, and since last year, we added uh, a lot uh, of information. So that's uh, because the talk was 20 minutes, and <laughs> the content <laughs> cannot be <laughs> <laughs> 14 uh, or more, yes, 50. <laughs> it's the longest paper in the book. So it's about uh, mainly uh, two subjects which have correlated, quantum work on spin network. Uh, so this is a new way of uh, making a loop quantum gravity with some new ideas. And a uh, golden ratio as a fundamental constant of nature. Uh, we first find the golden ratio in this first work, then uh, decide to search in other uh, very serious uh, publication in physics where it's directly related to physical phenomena uh, in black hole physics and other. And we present here a collection of the best. And uh, we generated um, a, a new approach to uh, use this as a dimensionless constant, uh, uh, which will be more fundamental than the other. And, and, and derive C, H, and G from it, so. So it was a collaboration of uh, Marcelo Amaral, myself, Raymond Hachem, Fang, Fang, and Klee Irwin. This is the table of contents. First, we will have a short introduction, expose the method and the results of the quantum work and then begin an ontological discussion, uh, which will be a little less uh, complicated result, but uh, more uh, ontology, because it was also the subject of the conference. Uh, we propose uh, the concept of minimal volume and charge from uh, loop quantum gravity and uh, uh, new insights that we, we, we add. Then we explain the principle behind the fundamental ratios. Uh, we explain the golden ratio, why it is a principle, and uh, document where we find him in physics uh, at uh, some new, very specific place. Then there is a discussion, and, uh, and I will not uh, have time to make the three last part. So this is the reference of the book, General Relativity, 1916-2016, uh, editors uh, Stefanov and Giovanelli, Minkowski, uh, Information Press. So the motivation of uh, our quantum work is uh, to use a Feynman path integral quantization So this is a general formula of the transition amplitude, which is an integral of a d operator and the exponential of the action multiplied by i divided by Planck constant. And uh, the discretization of the Feynman path, uh, so this are different trajectory between A and B. And uh, then we discretize this in another formula. Um, the principle of uh, quantum Randall walk uh, is uh, um, to use a quantum coin. Uh, so the steps are discretized. And you can go from here to here by, for example, two different. In fact, in a discretized uh, lattice, There is not uh, one unique uh, shortest path. There is uh, many, for example. Uh, these two shortest paths have the same length. So uh, uh, 
the result of uh, an algorithm of optimizing and minimizing the path will give a multiple solution anyway. So now I'm determined if you're looking for mo le mo path of least, you know, most efficiency, it's not determinist. Yes, yes, necessarily, yes. And um, we are uh, in the eat from bit uh, context. Uh, and from uh, an ontological viewpoint, uh, we will see that the dynamics and the mass emerge from the spin network topology. So essentially, the really new and interesting thing is an emergence of a mass. Uh, and this is implemented by the quantum walk that I will explain to you. Uh, dynamics also, but dynamics, it's trivial in a quantum walk, something is moving. <laughs> Uh, you will see also how we encode what is moving. The position is new and the mass. So this is the formula of a spin network. We have a graph, which is a set of uh, vertices and a set of edge. And uh, then you have uh, uh, on the edge, you have links, so that's why, and the links uh, are equipped, decorated with a spin, uh, which is a half integer. And uh, for the particle state space, the relevant contribution comes from the position on the vertices of the graph. Uh, we can uh, design a classical uh, Hamiltonian operator on a fixed uh, spin network, which is described in this paper from uh, Carlo Rovelli and Francesca Vidotto. Uh, so the bracket of psi h and psi is equal to a constant times a sum on the links of the, the spin number of the links multiplied by itself plus one. Uh, so this is well known that the square root of this is the uh, is the dimension value, uh, uh, area quantization, and we multiply this by the difference between the value of the wave function at the end of the link and the value of the wave function at the beginning of the link uh, at the square. So this is already said. So here we change the notation. Uh, the link L uh, is uh, indices with MN if it starts at the vertex M and it finished at the vertex N. Uh, and uh, then the wave function on the end, end point will be uh, notated uh, like this, psi of Vm and uh, psi of Vn. No, Vm is for the first point and Vn for the end. So we just uh, rewrite the equation like this, bracket of uh, psi h, which is the Hamiltonian, and psi, so the action of the Hamiltonian, um, the, the square of the action of the Hamiltonian. So this is the square of the probabilities proportional to the sum of gmn, gmn plus one, uh, square of psi vn minus psi vm. So then the random walk associated with this is just uh, a transition probability defined like this. <coughs> this is a transition, the probability pmn of having uh, this value uh, GMN, GMN plus one, the, which is in fact the, the, the area of the corresponding to this link, the discretized area, quantized area, divided by the sum of uh, these areas. And this gives a probability. Um, this, is in, this is the, in fact, uh, we divide by the, the areas of all possible links coming from the, from the vertices. 
So the vertice has several possibilities. The, the quantum walk, the quantum walker is at the vertice M and it can go toward uh, some vertices which are linked, which are the J, JMK. And the probability of going to one of them, which is JMN, is just this divided by this so. This is uh, quite uh, obvious when we explain. And um, uh, to do this, we were inspired uh, by the work of uh, Garcia Islas, which is available here on archive. Uh, then the quantum walk itself uh, is made by using uh, two Hilbert space, uh, one at the initial vertex, Hn, and uh, one at the final vertex, Hm. And we will do a tensor product of this Hilbert space. And uh, then if Nv is the number of vertex, uh, the state of the walk is given in the product of the Hilbert space, H, Hn uh, for every vertex, so we say to the power Nv, uh, tensored with Hm to the power Nv, uh, which is spent by these bases, by states at the previous uh, bracket of, of M, and the current a bracket of n steps, which is defined, and this is a CJD walk, CJD quantum walk. By this function, uh, the bracket of uh, psi n, so the final uh, vertex at the time t, is the sum on all the possible initial m of the square root of the probability to go from m to n, which was on the last slide, uh, operated with uh, the tensor product of uh, the n uh, and the m states. So this part, we have many formula. You, you will maybe not uh, understand uh, everything, but uh, you will have a kind of uh, good idea of what is a quantum world. And at, after that, you will have some graphics which will be more illustrative. But we need first to, to give this, uh, and this is more detailed in the, in the book. Uh, so the quantum world for, uh, because the evolution defines a reflection, um, this is, the implementation of the quantum uh, coin. Uh, we use a coin operator, uh, which formula is C is equals to two times uh, the sum of the psi n state with, its, with its itself uh, minus the identity. And the swap operator S, which is uh, swapping the, the sum on uh, of all links on the swapping of the states from M to N and N to M. And uh, this gives a unitary evolution, U, which is equal to the product CS. Uh, and uh, this defines the discrete quantum walk. Uh, also, this is more detailed in the reference and in the book. <coughs> uh, so therefore, we can compute it by using the, the equation we had. Uh, P was given before with a simple equation. And uh, then we will just get this. It's just by replacing PMN by its expression. So I repeat the formula. The, uh, the bracket of psi n at times t is the sum on the m uh, initial uh, vertice of the square root of the probability of going from M to N, which is uh, the area of uh, uh, deducted by the, the links <coughs> between M N divided by the sum of the other areas of the links uh, MK, uh, because uh, 
All the space is contained in loop quantum gravity around the vertice. And uh, it is the, area, the total area uh, of the space around this uh, vertex is the sum of the area affected to each link coming from this vertex. So this formula is just giving a, a, a ratio of uh, the area in what direction to the, all the area. So this is uh, quite obvious. The only thing which is a little strange, so you have to read uh, loop quantum gravity to understand why. This is uh, why this is GMN, GMN plus one, and not GMN square. But in fact, it will not change a lot. And then this probability is multiplied by this uh, uh, state of Hilbert, sta Hilbert space. So then um, we published this paper on archive and we, we got some uh, comments uh, from other scientists like uh, Johannes Turigen. Who, who was also studying a similar uh, uh, theory and uh, uh, suggest us to use other types of Laplacians and this one. So this is uh, one uh, work to do uh, later, which can give good result. You, we can also uh, try uh, a quantum walk of two particles uh, and the entanglement of these particles. Um, and uh, compute the continuum limit. So there are some more uh, things to do, but this is not finished. Now we will uh, be able to compute uh, an entropy of entanglement, or entanglement entropy. Uh, this is using a, a trick which is named the Schmidt decomposition. I don't know if it's yours. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a cousin. <laughs> uh, uh, so for this, you take a Hilbert space, H, and decompose it into two subspaces, H1 of dimension N1, H2 of dimension N2, which is bigger than N1, so that H is the tensor product of H1 and H2. So if we have a wave function in this... Uh, Hilbert space, and uh, uh, then we design the part in uh, H1, the projection is H1 by uh, Psi I1, and the projection of to H2 in Psi 1, 2, and we have positive real numbers, a family of lambda I, then the Schmidt decomposition is just that Psi is a sum uh, um, until uh, n1, so the dimension, uh, the smallest dimension, of square root of lambda i uh, times the tensor product of the part of the psi projected to 1 and the part of the psi projected to 2. Excuse me, Raymond, is this always possible or is an assumption, the, the composition uh, on tensor products? Is this uh, the, the beginning? It, yeah, I mean, uh, the 10, the position 10, the decomposition of H calligraphic mm -hmm. the tensor product, uh, is it an assumption or, I mean, uh, you can uh, always do that? Um, because it seems to me that... Uh, no, it's, uh, it's an assumption. We have to reduce... Uh, right? Yes, we have to right. reduce to the fact that we can do... So it's a this. factorized Hilbert space. That's yes. It. You start with that. Or yes. Is it a separable Hilbert space or factorized? Well, <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, I mean, in, in the sense that uh, you have a tensor product structure, that's what I mean. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. And, um, but we should have uh, for, the, for the quantum walk by uh, the building of the coin. The, co the coin so is I mean itself a tensor have, product. Uh, you can't have a quantum walk in non-factorized or non-separable inverse phases? Um, Maybe a different quantum walk. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Mm. So this lambda i are named the Schmidt coefficients, uh, and the number uh, of term n1 is the Schmidt rank. 
that we label n. And uh, then we can compute the entanglement entropy between the two sub subspace. And uh, this is uh, just the sum of i of lambda i log of lambda i. So now after some complicated formula, in the end we have a very simple formula and that we will be able to compute. But I like this. So we have uh, <laughs> the abstract expression of physics, but at the end we have something that we can compute. Uh, but everything is demon. Yes. Yes. Uh, can you, I mean, uh, you have a, a proof that that's always positive? That's what I mean. Because you have a minus in front, so you should have the sum, uh, the old sum is negative. So if lambda is less than one. Yeah, I mean. Yes, if lambda is less than one, yes, yes. You must meet the coefficients to mm. some range, right? Yes, but yes, there, there will be uh, in our construction now the lambda, there will be less than one because they built by probabilities. Uh, because uh, for the lambda, we use a PMN. So this is a probability. This is ah, necessarily... Okay. Uh, it is a probability. Uh, it is normalized. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Smaller than one, so this is positive. You are okay. sure. Okay. Uh, so that uh, we can now calculate the local entanglement entropy between the previous steps and the current n step. Uh, identify the Schmidt coefficient lambda with the probability. And note that the Schmidt rank is the valence of the node, the number of links arriving to this node. And then we have a quite simple formula for the entanglement entropy. And uh, we can maxi maximize it, so the maximal possible value is uh, log of n max. And uh, when n max is the largest valence, And uh, in general, um, <coughs> well, it's for particular, so, but we, have st we will study the case where the particle will move to a place where the entropy is the largest. So there is many possible cases, but generally uh, the particle will move to a place. So we can compute the entropy at each node with our formula of a network. And then the particle uh, will move uh, where the entropy is maximum. We move, I mean, you assume, you are going to study the cases in which this will move to the largest entropy. Uh, uh, yes, we, we have studied this. This is, a, this is a result, but that we don't detail by making computation. Generally, it goes to, uh, it's more probable just by using the probability, it's more probable to go to the, uh, to go where the entropy is largest. Because then the probability automatically is bigger. But this is not valid everywhere, but statistically this is uh, valid uh, at the most point. Because it doesn't depend uh, only on one node, it depends on what is around. Yeah. So we can find some exception when this is not true. But generally this is the law. And this can be thought of an entropic motion. Uh, so this is the first uh, interesting uh, result. We define an entropic motion on a graph uh, by using a quantum, uh, quantum uh, walk, but which is in reality quite uh, simple to compute. Uh, after that, we, we compute the change of entropy with respect to the position, uh, we have a discrete system, and um, we will see that the variation of entropy with respect to position, with respect to position, is just a difference of the local entropies at the neighbor vertices. So, uh, it's the absolute value of the difference of entropy, and it is proportional. Uh, to a small number which can be identified with a particle mass. So we have an emergent mass from the difference of entropy, the local difference of entropy. So this is the second result. First result, we have the entropy. It gives the motions. Second result, uh, by the local difference of entropy, we can uh, 
uh, compute a mass. So this is the simplest way of making a mass emerge uh, in a physics model. Wouldn't that depend, I mean, because it seems that in Formula 15 uh, you have uh, that uh, the mass will depend uh, from n m indices. Oh, okay. yes. So, I mean, it's, yes. Uh, it's yes, a yes. step dependent. Uh, yes, 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 right. yes. Because, uh, in fact, a particle of a mass m will be able to move only between the link which are uh, satisfying this. Uh, this is a constraint for a mass. Okay. The mass comes from a constraint. Or it will be more clear with, uh, with the from graphic. A constraint yes. which changes uh, at each, uh, I mean. Uh, Change of entropy. Yeah, but I mean, so at each step in the quantum walk. Oh, yes. Right? Yes. OK. So and would you div divide by like the length, characteristic length of the each step as well in there? Because it's ds dx. I'm just thinking of like the dimensional analysis of it, the units of it. I guess like, it's a unit step. So uh, I mean, you just set, like a clock yeah, I mean, length. Oh yes, x is a yeah, length. Is is a length is a unit length of the network. Yes. And yeah. the dimension of the, the function. constant alpha is a bit divided by mass. Then and. Uh, we will see here. Um, so now, I, from the formula that I have before, I compute the local entropy. So this is an important formula. At each uh, vertex, <coughs> the local entropy is uh, uh, log of sigma, where sigma is uh, the sum of uh, the area coming from uh, uh, a link M to the net bourse. And this is the sum for every link. So this is a global parameter of my graph. It's not very important. And minus 1 over this, because I use this to normalize. And then this is the sum of uh, on M. Oh, no, sorry, uh, it's uh, n, n is fixed, so this is not global. This is to normalize uh, comparing for the, l for the node n. Uh, so maybe I go, I repeat because I... It, That's it, the it, sigma n. entropy at the, at the node n, right? <coughs> this is the yeah. local entropy at the like node n, n. yes. Yeah. I have a first term <coughs> which will be used here to normalize was the denominator of the probability. And this is the sum of the area coming to this node. This is like the local uh, surface around this node. <coughs> and then minus the sum of this local surface, but weighted by the log of itself uh, to all uh, direction, along all uh, edge coming from this node divided by this sum, which is bigger, to normalize. And um, for example, uh, at a node which has uh, links uh, 1, 3 thirds, and 3 thirds, for example, uh, which is represented here by um, uh, two loops, a um, uh, graph is uh, not very high resolution. Um, it's a, this is this one, for example. You see that here you have uh, three loops around this node. You have, uh, it's, it's a little more thick because we have uh, two loops inside of this uh, hexagon and one loop is in, inside of this one. So here we have three loops, here we have three loops, and here we have only two loops. And uh, this number of loops, so I am covering a graph by closed loops, and uh, the half of the number of loops on all edge is necessarily uh, a quantum number, uh, G, half integer, which satisfies the Klebsch-Gordan uh, equation. So this is a simple way of uh, building spin network by automatically uh, satisfying Klebsch-Gordon, which is a constraint, uh, it's a constraint for the temple. 
Yes. Okay. Addition of so momentum. Each loop gives you a h out contribution to the total thing, right? Yes. 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 And I choose arbitrary to put loops here, but uh, it's relatively regular, but not totally. And uh, we will see the, the results that we have. But for example, for this, this node here, uh, I got a, a sigma of uh, 19 over 2, which is this, the sigma of the kind of compute. And this gives uh, here a local entropy of 1,06. At another node 222, two, two, which has uh, only uh, one, uh, one loop, so a node like this one, for example, 222, two, two. Uh, J the spins are 1, 1, 1, and this gives a sigma which is bigger, 6, and a local entropy which is also bigger, 1,09. And this is the maximal possible local entropy, this entropy here. So now I have color coded the local entropy at each of the nodes. So all the nodes which have the same color, they, they have the same uh, kind of net boring. And um, we know that a massive particle can move along a constant absolute color difference. So it will be kind of checkerboard between, for example, uh, orange, red, orange, red, orange, red, or uh, blue, orange, blue, orange. Or sometimes it could be more complicated combination, but will be, which will satisfy the fact that each time the absolute difference the, of entropy is the same. And then this is the mass. Uh, and in fact, it's not uh, trivial to find a graph uh, <laughs> Which gives a long pass, yes. So there, there can be particles that just stay fixed because they have a mass which is not, I mean, uh, they, I mean, there can be paths that are just uh, uh, length uh, of length one in the, right? So the particle which has that. Oh, yes, mass, the particle stay, which is just uh, uh, oscillating between two nodes. Ah, yeah, in there. For example, yeah. yes. Yeah. Or uh, oscillating around a node here. So this is always possible, uh, dynamic, which is possible, but which is not very interesting. Oh, yes. But it's also possible to have some paths, and it's also possible to have here, for example, uh, along a cycle of orange dots, I can have a photon. I can have a massless particle cycling uh, on node of the same entropy. So by design, I can have massless particle and massive particle. So this is um, the main result. Um, so another part uh, is to encode uh, the Walker position. And um, if you know what is a Pachner move, 3, 1, uh, and 1, 3 Pachner move, uh, it will be good. Otherwise, I can just. Uh, Write it in the table, it will be simpler. A 1 3 Pachner move in a network, in a trivalent network, is to go from this node to this. In fact, this is a, the insertion of a triangle instead of a, of a node. 1 3. And 3-1 uh, is just the reverse operation. So you will see that by modifying the topology of the, of the network, we can uh, uh, set our, uh, the position of our walker. Because in the graph that we showed before, there was a possibility of having walker, but I was not, uh, there was no walker. So here the walker is defined by uh, uh, this, the addition of three new nodes and the configuration which makes appear uh, a simple triangle. And then Ray, if I could introduce it. You can think of it in terms of the cut projection idea. Imagine that you're moving your cut window through some cubic lattice, projecting it to the 
to the plane there, and so as at one point, at one point in your projection, it's it's a one in the Poshner one three move, and then you just go an infinitesimal distance further, and you have a very small triangle that grows and grows, and then converges back again to a one, like in a in a oscillating manner. And then I will present a kind of animation. So this Walker. So I have a walker here. I compute the probability at the net bores, and then I know where he will be at the next time. And uh, he should be here. So we have this topological uh, uh, modification. And uh, in this case, we, we even didn't have to modify the loop themselves, just the contact point of the loop, so the nodes. So, uh, Ah, because yes, it's a couple of 3-1 and 1-3. I, I have a 3-1, three, 3 becomes 1, and 1 group becomes 3. Uh, which is simple that uh, just making 1-1-3 one, one, or 1-3-3. Or one, three, three. It's uh, more fundamental to work in couple, couple of these uh, Pachner moves. Is that a sw uh, swap or reflection yes. or both? The swap. Uh, swap. Yes, yeah, Oh, you can see this here as a swap, yes, but that will not be exactly a swap because here, for example, the number of, uh, of loop, there is one remaining loop, here there is two. But locally, here, on this edge, this is just a swap of the edge. This is, yes, right. When, when it goes from one node to another node, there is a, a swap of the, of the configuration uh, of, this, uh, of this node and of what happens uh, on uh, each side of the intermediary node uh, on the edge. Because um, a walker is encoded by three nodes. And uh, when he moves, one of the three is swapped. This one. Uh, no, no. Um, when it moves, the geometry is swapped around one of these. So in fact, one of these, which is the center of swapping or reflection, uh, doesn't move. And the two others, they, they, they disappear, and two others appear here. So uh, anyway, you can describe it in many ways, but uh, graphically, it's totally clear <laughs> what happens. And uh, the next, then he goes there. And she goes there, out of my screen. So it's a, it's a dynamic uh, encoded in a topology. The next attempt um, is using the, the same quantum walk, but for a different application. Um, no more uh, dynamical model at uh, eventual Planck scale. But now we will go to the other side, uh, to the cosmological side, and we will study a black hole with our tool. So we can also propose that uh, the quantum walk is the black hole quantum horizon, and uh, the particle mass here is the black hole mass uh, in a quantum uh, walk on a fixed spin network. So it's no more uh, an evol a dynamic spin network. And, um, Sorry, you mean a uh, uh, ray that the two-dimensional path is the horizon of the black hole? Is the quantum horizon? Yes. Yes, okay. the spin network okay. is the horizon of the okay. black hole now. And this is based on a work by Carlo Rovelli, uh, who is published. I will give the citation. Uh, we have just changed a little, and um, we will present some results. The spin uh, network pierces the horizon. Yes, the links. The links uh, are uh, encoding the information and okay. piercing the, the horizon. So in this uh, isolated quantum horizons formulation, the entropy is uh, usually calculated by considering the eigenvalues of the area operator and introducing an area interval, uh, delta A equals uh, uh, A of j minus delta, uh, small delta and plus small delta of this width of the order of the Planck length, so a small uh, uh, layer with relation to the classical area of the horizon. So A is uh, 
8 pi immediate parameter, gamma immediate parameter, uh, square of the Planck length, and the sum of this, uh, of the square root of the element of area, gl, uh, gl plus 1, that we studied before. And then the entropy in an adimensional form is uh, uh, S of uh, the black hole, the log of N, and N is the number of microstates of the quantum geometry on the horizon, uh, which is implemented by uh, considering uh, states, like Carlos said, uh, where the link sequence implements this condition, that uh, this constant multiplied by this sum is uh, smaller than uh, this A area, uh, where n is the number of admissible uh, uh, spins which puncture the horizon area. So this is a uh, classical, uh, nothing new uh, there. And then <coughs> let's investigate uh, how the horizon area and the related entropy can be emergent from the maximal entanglement entropy of a DQV of a discrete quantum volk. This is also an idea of Carlo Rovelli. Considering the edge coloring, the maximal... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes? Uh, that condition and that disequality that you were showing before in the previous slide, um, it's a condition on the, on the quantum volk that you have on the horizon, but depends on A. So you yes. in some sense, A is your <coughs> input. Uh, it, it's a classical parameter that you have uh, on, as input. Um, it will become a, a. a variable here, yes. Yes. This is what I, I explained the formula after uh, okay. how we get to a result. Okay, because it seems that uh, you need an input uh, A and then you select uh, the quantum walk, those spins, those sides that, that satisfy that disequality, right? Yes, yes, it's for uh, a fixed A, yes. So it's the fixed, right, so you have a, 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 as an input. Yes. Okay. And. Uh, Yes, sorry, yes, I, I said <laughs> the A is an input. And, um, and then the maximal entanglement is uh, uh, when the spins are very big, very large spin. So this is the condition of maximal entanglement in the black hole. So then we can rewrite the condition like this, simply the sum of the AI, which are this, is equals to AC which uh, comes from A. And uh, uh, the dominant contribution uh, here overestimated. So it, uh, it's, it's why we find a diff relatively different value. You cannot compute this exactly, so we make an overestimation. And uh, we count the N of AC which give n of for a, and uh, all small a are integer, and then the formula simplify like this, ll plus 2. In fact, this is the formula, but uh, simplify, and it's like l. So then, at the end, we have a combinatorial problem uh, to find this n of ac, such that uh, the equation here uh, below equation 20, uh, this sum holds. Uh, and then uh, we need at least two elements. And so we have to count the partitions of a number AC, an integer AC, in parts with two or more elements. This is a simple, now a simple combinatoric problem at the end. Noting that all the partitions of AC plus one in parts with two or more elements can be obtained, obtained from the sum of partition of AC and AC minus one by this relation. There are the sum. Like you recognize something. Like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the Fibonacci sequence here. Uh, it's just the AC uh, Fibonacci number. So we have solved the problem. And at the end, we get this, the log of N of A is log of phi, which is now the golden ratio, divided by pi uh, immediate parameter, A, 
uh, that we fixed in the beginning divided by four, uh, so this is the same constant, yeah, L so Planck square. Vacant sign, right? The area in four Planck square units is the Bacon sign. Yes, okay. this is related to the Bekenstein uh, entropy, but now we have the log of phi. We have a prefactor. Okay. Yes. Okay. And the immediate parameter? Okay. And the immediate parameter, yes. Okay, I'll continue. Yeah. And Sorry, uh, Ray, uh, what's the, can you estimate, what's, I mean, what's the prefactor, as Carol was saying, in front of the Bekenstein Hawking? Yeah. What's the what's value, the what's the numerical value of them? Of log log of phi? I mean, uh, of log of phi over pi gamma. Yeah. What's ah. What is the because I mean, uh, you are correcting the the Bekenstein Hawking. Uh, oh yes, yes, right. But so I would like, yeah, yeah. <coughs> I would like to know what's the how much is it? Oh, uh, that's important because uh, it seems uh, that yes, uh, uh, it's probably uh, more detail in the book. Okay. Uh, let's okay, see. Okay, okay. I mean, uh, or you, or yes. you are. Yes. Are you deriving the value of the medicine parameter? Are you deriving the value of the medicine parameter in terms of the golden mean? Yes, this, ah, this is what we will do ah, next. Ah, okay, yes. Okay. So, I mean, uh, we will propose a new one, value, one, yes. One. So that's okay. And then gamma so is nothing but pi times log of phi. I see. So you are fixing, you are deriving the value because of the medicine parameter. Uh, <coughs> that I was doubting because the Bekenstein Hogan uh, entropy area formula should hold. I mean, uh, they always always look, well, they are logarithmic corrections to the in there. entropy. Yeah. But uh, you don't have a prefactor correction. Yeah. I mean, you have uh, the, that plus some leading I terms. See, I see, I see. So I would say that you can derive the gamma in this con in this framework. Wait, wait, let me do it. Yeah. Oh. I have a lot of experience with that. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's interesting. So you well, this is a large n limit, really. Oh, yes, 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 okay. yes. Okay. yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's why that's you cannot correct the Bekenstein Hogan because in the large n limit I would expect some semi classical result to hold. Sure. Right. So, so ah, then this is the value. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we get this value for the immediate parameter, ah, 0, 0,22. Miracle. And this is uh, the log uh, in base 2 of phi divided by pi. And uh, in some slide after, we will rewrite, rewrite this formula uh, in a different way. But this is the result, and it's agree with the result from LQG. Ah, okay, so it fits so. the value that they usually take for gamma? It's near. It's near. It's near. Okay, good. But bad, because you were uh, overestimating. Right? Yes. So in some yes. sense, you're expecting something smaller, I guess, for gamma. Mm. Mm. And then are you going to show the Rovelli uh, <coughs> derivation, the Marcello? <coughs> this is similar to Marcello's, right? Yes, but it comes from the Rovelli. The Rovelli was used before. Yeah, yeah. And, and then, then uh, we have combined this uh, with the immediate parameter to and get then, this. And uh, do you have a slide to share the Davies? Uh, yes, after, uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, and I will have this equation again and the other, yes. But now we have the demonstration. Uh, of this equation. So to have a little more, uh, all the demonstration, it's in the book, in the complete uh, article. But uh, <coughs> so these are our results. The results from loop quantum gravity suggest the interesting idea that we can apply the results and tools from quantum information and quantum computation to a quantum space time. So this is a field of research very promising especially if we also uh, make quantum compute computation here. So in this work, we start a project to apply these tools to space-time. And uh, we have considered the discrete quantum work of a quantum particle on a quantum gravitational field and studied the applications of related entanglement entropy. So this is a conclusion of this part. And now uh, we will... Um, extend to other uh, appearance of the golden ratio in physics in this discussion. Relating this model with the quasi-crystal E8 model, this is under investigation. This is uh, our work now. The spin network can be chosen as a dual of a quasi-crystal. So this is what uh, Klee explained uh, as an answer to the question. And the digital physics rules could be implemented by the quantum walk. 
So we will try to relate this quantum walk system with the cotton project uh, in the, from the higher dimension. So that the walks will effectively become <coughs> the phasons, phasons yes. guided by projection operators. But this is still a uh, work in progress now. Yeah. This. And Do there is a... That, uh, in, instead of the spins on each side, uh, instead of the SU2 decoration, you will have empires? We will also use empires, yes. But not necessarily instead well, of, of SU2. Bible. Empire is just, think of an empire as just the skeleton. And like, think of the, think of the empire like the primes, like the skeleton backbone of any legal quasi-crystal. Mm -hmm. And then how it changes over two or more frames is just the dynamism of the system. And the thing about it is if it changes in one location, it changes globally instantly. Mm. So then that is locally looks like a random walk. I mean, so you're looking at it locally, it's like, you know. Yes. It, it, globally, will, uh, it will ensure. The yes. empires, it's inherently um, non-local and the empire is a deep part of that. Because I remember yesterday, Emmerich uh, did a change in his, uh, uh, he started with the IZ model and then he replaced the spins with an uh, uh, empire field. Uh, so you might play the same game here, because here you have, uh, instead of JL at the site L, you might have a certain uh, empire field right. all the way to the site L. Of course, locally, uh, as you say, it's a quantum walk, but uh, it has some coherence uh, globally, because I mean, yes. it's a well-defined global hmm. field. Probably, uh, we, this is when I say work in progress, to extend to many particles, then we can implement uh, the new version of Hamiltonian that Amrik will develop yeah. of the empire yeah. but I here should, to... I should add to Alicio's comment, because your comment is kind of, it uh, seems to be motivated by this idea of just simplicity and what can represent, you know, things like spin in this model. And one of the things that, even though it's under investigation, we don't have it yet, and um, is that we have a few binary values in fundamental physics. We have, an, we have charge, we have spin, and we have uh, polarity, right? North-south on your poles. And so what are those three binary values going to be in the QSN? And by the way, will it turn out, uh, oh, and there's one more, there's chirality. So there's so so we have chirality, absolute chirality, and then we have this other binary value which is called um, kind of chirality parity. So you're either doing your ro your rotation with in cooperation with the helix or in the opposite of the helix. So that's a binary value. And then we have on these fifty seven groups the empire fields. They behave they behave like uh, charges. I think where if you if you if you have your empire field because your pole is pointed to me the trips that whole idea of trip anti parity and parity it's all about it, whether we're going to be north north or are we going to be north south and that'll define whether we have trip parity or anti parity so that's all that we've got to play with plus and the empire waves are what are the construct or the skeleton of these uh, trip fields that are all about helicity. Uh, so what spin is, I don't know, but it has to be one of those tools that we have to work with. Indeed, but in, I mean, um, when you consider empire field, in my very naive view, you might uh, implement uh, global effects on this quantum world, because uh, as far as it seems, uh, this is a very local statement because the mass is defined locally, and uh, so I mean everything is local, uh, but if you upgrade the spin to the value of the empire field, I mean, it might... Then, it'll, might then it won't be, <coughs> it'll drop in density, but it'll never end. It'll drop in density as it goes further out. Yes. It's influenced, but it will go to the end of the universe, eat, right? Each of these uh, massive particle empire fields. Yes, yeah, because it's intrinsically not local. Yeah. Uh, yes, so this is uh, what I've written as a work to do. Last, next work to do is multiple particles, and effectively the multi multiple particles will be multiple walkers, which will be the phasons, and when uh, they come from cotton project, you have several phasons which are synchronized, and here 
they are entangled and there will be their entanglement will be the effect of the Hamiltonian which will include the empire uh, which has to correct the Hamiltonian which is actually used uh, for only one particle. Ah, okay. You see in the string theory in the past few years what has become very 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 important is the the real Janagi <coughs> ent entanglement entropy. Yeah. So it's a relation between the entanglement entropy on the boundary. Mm -hmm. How is it related to the entropy in the bulk? Yes. And it, well, it's related to the mass. Yes, the yes. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, yes. So it would be interesting to yeah, also you see how you can implement some sort of bulk boundary <coughs> duality or correspondence. Which yeah. is interesting because yeah. what Carlos is saying, I mean, uh, uh, it's uh, an application of the, the ADS-CFT, so you see a quantity in the bulk where there is gravity, and so a quantity is the entropy of the black hole, and then they are trying to reproduce this uh, in uh, conformal field theory on the, on the curved boundary, yeah. which in this case actually is uh, the horizon, is the, is the horizon surface. Actually, this is, um, uh, so in some sense, uh, I will call this a particular uh, incarnation of the ADS-CFT idea because, uh, I mean, you start from a quantum walk in a two-dimensional space, which, are yes. surface, which is the quantum black hole horizon, and then uh, you relate to a quantity which usually is just a quantity, is a gravitational quantity. Uh, so in some sense, uh, you don't have gravity on your quantum black hole horizon. There is no gravity effect. <coughs> no, we have but the mass, you, yes. Yeah, so you Entropic. describe something which actually is, is coming from gravity. So it's very suggestive of this uh, holographic... Uh, principle. Yeah. 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 ADS is a, is, a, is a co set anyway. Yes. So you could think um, at the E8 level, Yes. you can define a higher co set. I mean, even the, the Cayley plane is a co set. Indeed. So yeah. one can ask, in such a co set, can, can I explain, is there some kind of holography? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. sure, sure. I mean, uh, Mike is saying, okay, instead of considering uh, your, uh, uh, your, uh, black, your quantum black hole horizon, you may define a quantum walk on a certain concept. Of course, this uh, is complicated in principle because you have to quantize your, con your concept, you have, you, have, you have to discretize, so you have to define uh, your, okay, I'm, Probably yeah, and also information, kind of really, uh, in the past few years, there has been a lot of work on the quantum information and uh, ADST, conformal field theory correspondence, but information really is non local. So maybe yes, this that's empire uh, picture may yeah. encode information non local. That's what is, uh, in my view, it's very, it's very nice in the empire field with the no locality because uh, uh, it makes this empire field intrinsically information theoretic. Mm. Uh, oh, absolutely. You should look at, you should look at the whole thing as just large integers interrelating because each, each mm. one-dimensional quasi-crystal that composites into the whole QSN and these empires and everything else is just can be thought of as a sequence of zeros and ones that encodes some unique integer, yeah. and um, and they interact. How those integers interact is one way, at least, to think about it. If you want to be completely information theoretic. Yeah. All right. You better okay. <laughs> so now we we are on another subject. On uh, in the discussion, we will uh, consider uh, uh, some ontological principle and uh, the minimal volume. Uh, which can emerge from uh, quantum gravity, a concept of minimal volume. In fact, uh, Carlo Rovelli and his team have demonstrated a, minima, a Planck area and a Planck volume quantized. So now we will discuss of the physics signification of this and how it could be uh, integrated into a view of the fundamental uh, ratio in physics. For example, uh, in uh, QED, this is the fine constant, uh, fine structure constant, alpha, um, <coughs> which is uh, E divided by G, a magnetic charge in Coulomb, multiplied by uh, an integer. 
and uh, it's something like 1 over 137. So you think alpha on the left hand side is like an E square divided by h bar C O. So when the yeah. E factors out, so this is the Dirac quantization condition. Okay, okay, so you're doing yes. a little bit of algebra and you're, you're rewrite it that way, okay. Yes, to yeah. simplify. Okay, I see. And then which number do you choose for n? Do you choose 1 in that case? Oh, because probably, yes. <laughs> yeah, the answer yes. is n equals to 1 in that case. Yes, it's the smallest value okay. that you can have for a dionic quantized uh, okay. charge. Yeah, okay. I see. So this is the uh, other formula that you mentioned with the E2. Yeah. Ah, OK, OK. So they are equivalent. Here we have uh, alpha minus 1. Here are the codata value for the Planck constant, because uh, we see that this is depending on the Planck constant. And what units are you using? Right, can I, I was, I'm sorry. me and Marcelo kind of co-wrote this section, so if you want I can say it, probably. Uh, yes, more right. than me. So yes. basically what, what, this, what this is here, it's really important for anybody doing theoretical physics to not get to, um, not be mistaken in what, into what the <coughs> knowledge is of scientists of the fundamental constants. So what we do is we, uh, we, we generally use this value, which is a dirty value, and I'm going to explain why. So we take the watt balance, the x-ray crystal density, Josephson constant methodology, magnetic resonance, etc. These are all completely different experimental approaches that were discovered at different times in scientific history, but that we still use. In other words, we don't default to the one that's the highest resolution. There are some that deal only uh, at the atomic scale, and that technology wasn't even available, you know, 40 years ago. And we don't, and so one of them, you can order them in terms of um, resolution, let's say, uh, according to the technology. and. By, by what the codata organization does is they take the low resolution and the high resolution values and they average them together. They create a weighted average. But what it does is it shows that there's a, a disagreement between these different approaches uh, after the third decimal place, after the fourth decimal place. So you can see that we only know these values in physics to here, right? That's it. That's the end of our scientific knowledge. After that, anything goes. And so, unless you want to get a couple more decimal places, you definitely don't want to use codata. You select what you think is the most technologically high resolution accurate data, and there's good reasons to know which ones those are. Uh, this seems to me rather, I mean, uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, alpha uh, depends on the energy. But you can it's a running carbon constant. I mean, uh, so, uh, to oh, me, it's guess, quite. Uh, I'm sorry, I guess this is the plan, the this is the structure at, at the. Uh, ah, so this radius. is evaluated that. Uh, at the atomic radius. No, no, it's not. This and no, because if, if you mix the average among, uh, I mean, but, but H depends on alpha, and so alpha the, depends the, on when H. We, when we measure mm -hmm. G and, and H, right? we have these experimental results. And CODATA, the organization that feeds the numbers that scientists use as they, do, as they argue with one another about their, which one of their theories is correct, they use this dirty, kind of polluted average instead of choosing the one that is the methodology that is at the atomic level. Some of, some of these uh, level, some of these um, approaches, uh, like the magnetic resonance approach, they are so sophisticated technologically that they weren't available in past decades, and they are higher resolution because they're at the atomic scale. Other ones are ancient methods. They still get used, and they get averaged into the codata results. So, um, what Alessio is referring to is, is slightly different, actually. So, okay. in quantum field theory and QED, um, it turns out that alpha is a function of the radius. Right. The so energy or the scale. Yeah, energy. the scale. Energy yeah. or distance, right? Yeah. So those yeah. are measured. But we don't know what energy and distance it oh, yes. are past <laughs> a few places. Uh, and in this case, I think it's the atomic, it's the Bohr radius or the hydrogen. Yeah. Right. Like what I'm saying is, is to build all the physics, you have to start with two things. Either C and H, or H and G, or G and C. And you don't need, you don't need all three. And then once you start, you choose which one of those two, 
you are subject to the extreme limitation in current experimental technology, which limits you in general to about the fourth place after the decimal. Because this is the same problem whether you're dealing with measurements for G or, or uh, H. You know, in, in terms uh, of experimental. I, I honestly, I mean, I'm not an experimentalist, but I mean, I don't understand why don't they choose uh, the most modern, uh, the highest resolution uh, experimental uh, re okay. result available. Maybe so you have an explanation. I, I do have an explanation. It, first of all, this process has been going on for decades. And before we recently got to an atomic scale kind of thing, there was actually arguments within the scientific community about different ones. Like it wasn't so cut and dry that the watt balance approach versus the x-ray crystal oh, density okay. approach was that much better. Was so what, but, but each one of these experiments is done by the best experimentalists and done millions of times so that in its regime, it's a really accurate number and these uh, error bars are accurate for that. But the problem is the different approaches are disagreeing. So all you, can, all you should know, if you haven't heard this before, is you can just trust where they agree. And that's it. So if your model for physics disagrees before the fourth decimal place, well, then you probably have a bad but model. This is, this is you know, but if it disagrees after the fourth decimal place, no experiment at least can't say that your model, your derivation is, is bad. And all I can say is that it seems to me that uh, I wonder how they do the weighted average. Because if the weighted average is done by using the group renormalization, the renormalization group, so by considering that uh, the uh, thing you are measuring varies with energy, like it is known, then I'm completely fine. But of course, uh, as you were saying, Lee, those results are different because they concern different uh, experiments, uh, and, the experiment and the energy scale of each experiment is different. Right. And then you will have that uh, the value of, uh, I mean, the Planck constant or, 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 or alpha, I mean, because they, they are related, uh, this will, um, we slightly vary. So our golden ratio values take us um, take us out to some known values in the literature uh, to the millionth place uh, or to the millionth uh, place, and um, we would suggest taking the highest energy value. That's just logical, and and just take the most technologically sophisticated high resolution, high energy value, and use that. And when we use that, it makes our golden ratio numbers look better, not worse, right? So I would expect that the golden ratio is related to the Planck scale. So I mean, really, to the asymptotical value of, the, of all these constants. Yeah. Also, point, know, sorry, go ahead. point to that is, if you, you don't want to go to infinite energy because um, that's short distance, and then alpha would go to infinity, technically. So yeah. yeah, we'll diverge. The, the, the conventionally, the usually, you want to choose a low energy value because um, it, it, it becomes more constant as you go to lower energies. So um, if, if you work at really low energies, even if you change your energy a lot by a, a large percentage, the value of alpha won't change as much as if you were at a higher energy. Yeah, I mean, point. for us, we, we're going to back into it through the QSN. And the QSN is going to force the answers upon us. Because yeah. if I have to plug numbers, I'll quit. Like, I won't be interested in this kind of physics. So I, I am expecting the QSN physics and how it's derived directly from E8 to, to actually give us all the fundamental constants in analytical expression form. And then I just have to hope to God after that that some experiment <laughs> doesn't show it to be wrong. And if it does, it's <laughs> wrong, because experiment would trump that. But I want to back into it you know, through theory, first principles, and then see if the if then that'll make predictions that we can do uh, some experimental stuff. Um, so, so I guess the point is, if you get the wrong answer at first, but you're close, it could be because you're like kind of renormalizing improperly, okay. which is a sophisticated issue. So yeah, I'm just, true. I'm just yeah, pointing yeah, that out. Because I mean, uh, as far as uh, I remember, quantum electrodynamics has been tested up to sixteen decimals. That's what they say. I'd like to know what your sixteen. Yeah, but I'd like to know we'll have later. Experimental, experimental. Well, yeah. I'd like to know. Yeah. I think that's. that's okay, I think that gets confusing because when you're when you're starting with 
values that you don't know what they are, like this is it. All of physics gets built of C, H, and G. That's it. You build up from the, well, two of those three to get the other third one and everything else after that, uh, Carlos. So what I'm saying is if you don't know experimentally the measured value of, let's say, G past the fourth decimal place, I don't understand what it means to say 16 but decimal I, I, places. But is it for the... But anyway... It, right, but, but meaning 16 <laughs> decimal places of what? Because the alpha most fundamental thing that I mentioned just now, like the G factor. Ah, yes, G but factor, factor dimensionless, yes. But, no, but the G, 16 of the G doesn't exist. We only know to the fourth decimal mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what it is. Mm -hmm. I know it's not, not any moment of the lecture. Yes. Anyway, because you see, I had this conversation with Tony Smith for many, many, many years. For, mm -hmm. you know, and I, um, because you know he, Tony was interested in the derivation of the fundamental constants from first principles, and he was very excited because in the 1960s there was this guy from Switzerland, Armand Weiler, who came from a very a nice derivation of the time structure constant based on pure geometry, on the volumes of fundamental domains. And Dyson was very excited about that, and he invited him to Princeton. So Tony wanted to extend that to the other coupling constants, the mm -hmm. electroweak interaction, the strong force. And, and the answers you get actually are the answers you get at certain uh, energy scales. So Tony and Wilder were able to derive the time structure constant, or the inverse of the time structure constant like that, once this uh, but, but, of course, yes. I, I, but that only occurs at, at the uh, wall radius. So it's interesting that the answer they got is the value of the fine structure constant at the wall radius, which is a nice physical uh, system. But anyway, go ahead. But, but, but what I was saying is, yeah. I, ho I hope this is helpful for your multi-year conversation with Tony, because I talked to Tony about this exact subject too. I don't know if this made a light bulb go off in your head. Yeah. We. When Tony says, oh, I've got a derivation from the mathematics I've played with yeah. that gives me 10 places uh, of, the, of, some, of the codata value of some fundamental number, yeah. and then I would say, well, Tony, we only know, humanity only knows with very good certainty to the fourth place after the decimal, because that's where all of them agree. It depends on what quantity you're talking about. Just because you have alpha and then you have G, just because you have four decimals in one doesn't mean it's going to uh, relate it, exactly to four decimals in the other as well. Uh, that's right, but the other one is about the same. In other words, there's G. Uh, I'll let you, uh, uh, Alberto, just give me one more second, because yeah. otherwise it's a break no, 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 in the no, no, continuity no. of this. So, there, so C, we just sort of plug kind of theoretically. So we don't, we don't, we kind of, we, we set Z, we set, C, we can set C in some sense to one, and then even though we don't really know the actual value of that. But the other two, uh, H and, and G, where you can get the fine structure constant by knowing those, those are the ones we can measure, and we can't measure them you know, past a few places after the decimal in a way that they agree. But of course, if you, take, if you just stick with the watt balance, Carlos, and you do a million measurements of that, and then you get a nice margin of error, and it takes you out to many decimals, then Tony could say, oh, my derivation matches that. And I'd say, all right, but for right now, until we can get some experiments that we all respect the experiment, because we can cast out old uh, antiquated experiments. But I'm assuming CoData knows what they're doing. Uh, so they're included currently all uh, of these methodologies here. So I'm assuming they're all good. And if they are all good, even though some could be better, if they are all good and they can only agree with one another with millions of instances of each experiment to the fourth decimal, then Tony's arguments or my arguments about, my arguments would be that the fundamental value is a golden ratio value. But my arguments don't really hold a lot of water with the experimental data because that only goes, you know, my golden ratio values, by the way, go out to here. So these values don't contradict my derivation. But it's not a convincing argument. Only thing that gets convincing is when you go back to the deep principles of E8 and all the, all the stuff that we want to work on and collaborate on. That's where you can get more convincing about uh, an e, you know, a golden ratio based um, Thing. And, and Alberto, we promise you, you're next. Uh, I just wanted to make a few observations. 
the first one is that because you're looking at the quasi integer, there's going to be a lot of algebraic formulas, and there is a history and tradition. And uh, using the golden ratio is natural for quasi integer for a certain number of reasons. So uh, the, the, the other difficulty is, is to create a physical model that justifies the formula. If you, if you create a physical model that justifies the formula and gives only the algebraic contribution and there's an algebraic part which might be small, that's extremely successful. That's who, the quasi who, who, ca who cares yeah. about, uh, right. about uh, this discussion uh, right. of how many decimals is in the net? Exactly. Yeah? exactly. So that's the first observation. The second observation is that uh, although this is a very delicate topic, uh, my understanding on the experimental side is one of the things that has been become clear through the new methods and the Josephson effect has been key in changing the view on these matters is that uh, although we look at alpha because of Sommerfeld dream and uh, all what happened in the history of the constant, uh, the, the, the constant that are measured with the highest level of precision are h bar over e and e over c is the ratios. Okay, So alpha is the ratio of the two that creates mm -hmm. problems with the with the precisions and the composition of the error, yeah? So the, the most fundamental uh, part, and is there's no clear reason why, except the, the macroscopical quantum effects tends to be extremely precise. Uh, so Joseph's, Joseph's own effects has shown that in metrology what matters is h bar over e. It's not the, the, the prime structure. Part. So also this discussion is, is more structured but I don't think it's relevant for what you're trying to achieve. If you get uh, uh, an algebraic level approximation of alpha or whatever constant uh, with a real physical intuition of how it's cal cal the calculation comes about, uh, that's an extraordinary <laughs> achievement. Yeah, I only so wanted to say one thing, which is don't I trust the codata numbers past the fourth decimal. That's it. Because when you get 60 <laughs> decimals of what? We don't know the value. You know, that, but yeah, no, so I'm agreeing that it's not, it's yes. not that important. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. uh, I will add something. Uh, don't, uh, oh, well, don't trust this slide <laughs> because the fourth decimal is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no one has seen it. It's a one, not a zero. <laughs> so no, you have four decimals. So maybe Klee, you. You want also to... Oh, well, I think we should skip past this because, as you said, Alberto, this isn't important, but, well, actually, this is the... Is it the this is for the quantization of the volume and... So... so um, we're running a short on time, and oh, I hope yes. some of you read the paper, but... Uh, we're going to give everybody copies of that book, by the way. But um, this is basically just talking about one of the most, probably arguably the most technologically advanced way to measure the gravitational constant, which was reported only in Nature in 2014, and is not even yet used in uh, the code data. I think that's in France where they do that. It's not even used uh, yet in those values, but it's, it's a Nature paper. It's the most sophisticated and high energy way to measure it. And, um, and when we uh, use that, um, it, makes, uh, <laughs> it makes our, <laughs> our assumptions of what these values are analytically, it makes it, it supports, as you'll see in the paper, it supports our, our uh, E8 kind of related view of what the analytical expression uh, of, of the fundamental constant yes, would be, and it would boil down to the golden ratio. We have defined a beta, which is a constant similar to the fine structure constant to compare, yeah. which is a ratio of the Planck volume over uh, a minimal volume, right. which will be bigger than the Planck volume and at the square. And after that, we have some comparison between alpha and beta right. in this. Uh, but if we run out of time, so you maybe. Say beta is yes. deeply related to phi, the golden ratio. And the latest, uh, high, the highest energy <coughs> resolutions, uh, you know, kind of peer reviewed by, you know, published in Nature, pretty credible, um, you know, so bring our, our 
theory that that's the right number, the golden ratio being this fundamental constant, brings it out a bunch of zeros. Does it tell you that the, what is the value of this so-called newly discovered Yeah. Same question. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, it's beta. Yes, we because give an estimation. Yes, yes. Yes, V0. Uh, Do you remember what value it is? Uh, it's on the next slide. Oh, okay. uh, uh, we give the value of beta, yes. So this, we can, uh, this is just the explanation we can pass. And uh, here we have the proposition of the formula for beta that uh, Carlos asked, uh, which is square root of beta is 1 over phi cube. Right, and the Kabibo angle is in these five, well, well I didn't tell you, David, but there's, uh, there's about six uh, particle physics, five or six particle physics papers in elite particle physics journals that contend that the Kabibo angle um, is, uh, Our cosine of the square root of 1 over 3, I might be mm. saying that incorrectly, but... But this um, beta is so a conjecture, so, huh? so that, we have some not, justification. Not but guys, yes, it's a conjecture. Like so that's why um, rigorous we can go that to... Got peer review published in big journals, and they're all different. So papers, here we like have the comparison. And uh, happens to be our, our value without the... I know that you were trying to relate the Kabibo angle to what, the Jitterbug angle or something? Uh, five, five, not us, uh, five other, uh, uh, six other authors among five different papers uh, in, uh, in particle physics peer reviewed journals have reported on it, and we, were, we, ex we give those references in uh, chapter okay. eight. Okay. Um, I mean, really elite physicists, like snob level physicists, uh, they're coming up with that, and so of course that. We're exploiting that to our benefit by citing that and pointing okay. that out here, but okay. we didn't discover it. So in my other presentation, uh, I have already uh, discussed how we can generate poly and Dirac matrices uh, with uh, bits and treats. Uh, we have uh, made a study of a statistical study of the eigenvalue of the small uh, uh, binary and ternary matrices, and also how it evolves when they are bigger. Uh, in fact, for the small matrix, until uh, five uh, or six, we have computed every possibility. We have something true. And after that, we have used the Monte Carlo approximation. You with Pascal in France? Yes. Okay. Yes. He, uh, I made the, the study, but he made some demonstration okay. about some property algebraic demonstration with the matrix of treats. And for example, We also have seen the a matrix with only mm -hmm. minus one and plus one, mm -hmm. and demonstrate that then we have no more golden ratio. <laughs> so we have not made more study of these matrices. But um, the matrix of treats, you, you have golden ratio. So this is, for, for example, for the five by five binary matrices. Uh, this is the representation of all the eigenvalues. And it's very interesting because We have uh, some uh, some eigenvalues which are uh, which have high probability. They are uh, they have a repulsing uh, behavior. So this is a universality uh, signature from Dyson. So this is just a proof uh, just by examining the, the spectrum. And uh, effectively, we have uh, the golden ratio here. It's, uh, it's uh, repulsing this here, but the main eigenvalue here are 0, 1, and minus 1, the trivial eigenvalue. And after that, you have here the golden ratio. And we see that the uh, minus 1 over the golden ratio here is also quite repulsive and has a high probability. And we have some complex, uh, some complex value here, conjugate. Uh, we have made also another study with only the symmetric matrices and all the eigenvalues are real and the golden ratio appears more. And, uh, and after dimension uh, 50, the golden ratio has a tendency to diminish and is replaced by five or number uh, quite uh, near five. 
So there is, but it's still there, but it's no more uh, the, the very big uh, guy. So the smaller the dimension, the more probable the golden ratio is. Yes, right? yes, yes. And after 50, uh, the behavior is changing. This is very strong. So there is many things to study this with the uh, eigenvalue spectrum of this matrix. Like, why do you think it's trying to converge at five? I mean, because that's golden ratio based. I mean, why? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and it's not, uh, yes, it's not for 5 by 5 bin bi binary matrix. It's for 50 by 50 or 100 like by 100. By a, it, as though that's a convergent, it's a convergent series or something at infinite yes. dimensions. It's exactly 5. It's, uh, it's, uh, and, yeah. and it's not only, it's spread on several. So there is 5 and there is other value which are, uh, which include, which are yeah. directly integer but near 5. And maybe after that there will be another step yeah. and another. It's very strange, very oh. strange. Uh, but the role of the golden ratio is very clear in the small sure. dimension. Sure. This is sure. Mm. <coughs> so this is. Um, mm. Do you want to? So this is my part of, my part of the writing. So. Um, so basically, we're trying to suggest that in this <laughs> abstract view of mathematic reality being mathematical, literally made of math information, not just describing something other than information. Uh, so this co-theoretic physics view uh, implies that um, in an information theoretic universe, um, you know, you would think that uh, the choice uh, of fundamental ratios and building blocks must be guided by this idea of the, the notion of John Numrich called uh, the, uh, the principle of least computational action in, in this famous paper that he's got. So this leads naturally to the golden ratio, okay, with its uh, powerful properties of being uh, deeply associated with icosions, gauge symmetry physics, uh, you know, how it's uh, the only number closed under multiplication and division that has the unique self-identical property that you're all familiar with, which allows which that property allows for maximally connected quantum topological uh, neural nets, these non-deterministic codes that you don't have to invent, they're just there. So if reality is code theoretic, its purpose then is to efficiently express meaning, such as physical meaning, physical information, with its ultimate conserved quantity, which is just these quantized actions uh, of the evolving substrate, which uh, at the end of the day boiled down to choices within the code. It's syntactical freedom. What makes it, who makes it, I don't, I, I think my best guess is some kind of emer self emergent consciousness that might do it, but, but it's, it's like, it's a, now a measurement, all these words, measurement, actualizing information. Information can never exist without being actualized by something, because information is meaning conveyed by symbolism, including self-referential symbolism. Or you could say observation, if you like that word. Um, you could say projection. You could say you know transformation. You can say operation. right? But all these words, in some sense, can be synonymous with the basic idea of choice, because you can, in quantum mechanics, before you can make a measurement, you must always make a choice, you know, of momentum or position, you have to choose. And in a code, you always constantly have to choose. So anyway, it boils down to syntactically free binary choices uh, in this uh, uh, self-emergent code theoretic network, where kind of somehow the code bootstraps itself and starts to operate itself, like act upon itself. And I know that seems weird, but you're doing it right now. <laughs> you guys emerged from the code, and if you think you have free will, you're now acting upon the code, because all your free will actions to go left instead of right are cascading downwards all the way to the Planck scale physics, and if there's a code down there, your emergent upper level stuff is steering it from way up here. So you're, the, you're an example, an experimental example, of an emergent entity coming back to really hijack its own kind of code down at the bottom. Like you're, it very well may be that the whole thing is a self-actualized simulation. 
especially if we were to go into quantum computing where we ditch Moore's law in the dust forever and move into godlike Star Trek levels of computation in a few years, and then we can simulate, if we like, this code in, in, a, in a small reality, like a city block worth of reality or something, I don't know, a room worth of full resolution reality to the Planck scale, if that were possible. Follow deck. Yeah. Start there. So now here we, with our minds, have, have self-organized physics to make a quantum computer to literally create, all the way to the Planck scale, this code, this would be if this code was the code of reality, and and now it's completely equivalent to physics. So that's an example of a low-level guy, you know, entity in the system, like a human, because it could get bigger than us, uh, self-actualizing a kind of universe. So what if it's just the limit of that is that the universe evolves and it gets bigger than us, or we start networking with each other the way cells networked in our bodies, and then an uber-consciousness forms forward ahead of us in space-time, and that is able to hold within its own consciousness uh, instead of having to build a computer to do it. Because uh, I can invent a simple computer or a cellular automaton in my mind, but I'm not that smart, so I can't do it you know, past, past a few you know, little, <laughs> little rules. So, uh, so with respect to physical codes, a lot of progress has been made in understanding quasi-crystal codes. It's just not many people have studied it. Um, but it's in the literature. The most famous is the DNA code, which is a golden ratio-based quasi-crystal biomolecule. Quasi-crystal codes in material science have also been studied. Uh, for example, this guy's a genius because in 1944, he predicted that the molecule encoding life would be a quasi-periodic crystal in those exact words before that term quasi-crystal was invented by Paul Steinhardt in the 1970s. And unlike a crystal, the assembly rules for a quasi-crystal allow self-organization or construction choices within the rules that are not forced. That is, they're non-deterministic. So again, that's due to the fractal self-similar, self-identical quality uh, that is unique to that fraction. Um, and this is what allows this thing I kept telling you yesterday, which is called the non-zero limit of spatiotemporal freedom. So if you're going to talk about a code made out of atoms or a code made out of graph actions, you want to you wanna massively restrict um, everything, but not all the way to the zero limit. You want to have the most um, restrictive, but not quite fully restricted uh, code. And that is where the golden ratio comes in. That's where this simple fraction uh, plays a role when you try to create topological nets of these ultimately simple Fibonacci chain codes. So a quasi-crystal uh, is, is just a structure that's ordered but not periodic and has long-range quasi-periodic uh, translational order and long-range. Um, uh, it, has, it has no long-range periodic trans, translational order. It has, a it has, it has rotational, uh, you can translate it by rotation, but you can't translate it by um, you can't, you can't translate, translate it. Uh, that's why it's quasi-periodic, in fact. Yeah. We say. So it has a discrete diffraction pattern, like I was telling you guys at, at dinner, I think, indicating order, but not periodicity. So if you ever hmm. find yourself looking at some pattern that, that looks chaotic, but you're not sure, it might have order in it, you just do a Fourier transform or diffraction pattern, and if it has discrete Bragg peaks, then you know. And that's the weird thing about the distribution of prime numbers, um, or the distribution of non-trivial zeta zeros is that when you run a diffraction pattern, you can, you can find out that it is a quasi-crystal. Um, so then quasi-crystals were discovered in nature only a few years ago. Uh, there's 300 of them discovered. Um, all of the 300 or so that are discovered, they're generally three-dimensional quasi-crystals with icosahedral uh, symmetry, which means they're all built out of the golden ratio. And most of these quasi-crystals, um, uh, are proje many of these, I, I should say, are, are projections uh, or subsets of the Elsers. I would say most of them can be, most of the ones discovered in nature, like in Fong explained in her presentation, can be derived by uh, taking three-dimensional slices of the Elser-Sloan quasi-crystal. Because 
They're, they have different decorations, but in general, the three-dimensional icosahedrally symmetric quasicrystals uh, are, are related to the simpler 3D Penrose tiling, um, or the little bit more uh, complicated um, one, which is what ours is based on, which has um, made of icosahedra, dodecahedra, and icosahedra. Mm -hmm. The Amon uh, tiling is the 3D Penrose tiling, that's the first yes. one. So the Amon tiling has 24 vertex types, and ours, which is a standard one that you can get um, in nature, um, has 36 vertex types, where 12 of those vertices sprout out or grow out from uh, 12 of the vertex types in the Amon tiling. So in other words, the information of the Amon tiling, the 3D Penrose tiling, uh, is embedded, or which is the projection of Z6, the cubic 6 lat, uh, is embedded in the QSN, and embedded also in the, um, the Elser Sloan E8 to, to uh, 4D quasicrystal. So most of these quasicrystals are projections or subsets of Elser Sloan quasicrystal, which is a cut in projection of the E8 lattice using this angle here. Now, do you guys remember, so, what we are showing in the earlier parts of these slides when you were out, Alessio, is that this value, 1 over, this, over 5 squared, is this value that we call beta. And we, can show, and we try to show using the most advanced measurements of the fundamental constants, which were published in Nature in 2014, um, and the highest energy ever. And, um, and our value we can get our value out to something like the millionth place after the decimal, which is way better than, the, than you can find in the code data at the fourth place after the decimal. So not the, million, the millionth place or the fourth digit after the decimal, but we go out to like six or seven. So the point is, is that it's very remarkable because we're saying that this is the Weinberg angle, but we put with the love, with, with um, we're saying that so when you manipulate this equation with just the the uh, another the, uh, the 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 arc cosine, for example, you get the Weinberg angle. What we say is the Weinberg angle. Some other authors have already suggested that a related angle, this 15.522 degree angle, uh, is um, the the Kabibo angle, one of the most important important of the 19 parameters of the standard model, and it's. Five, five different peer-reviewed particle physics papers, which are kind of hard to get into, you know? It's not so easy to... We, we will uh, detail this after... Yeah, yeah, sorry. Videos. So anyway, so but the, the point is, is um, that, that beta number is this. This is the number that you use to project E8 to 4D. Mm -hmm. And so it's very E8 remaining. So bringing together a bunch of this stuff, um, to support our basic conjecture that the coupling constant at the Planck scale is 1 over 5 uh, cube, uh, which is the quantization of charge and the proposed discretization of space time. So simplex integers as shape numbers are the fundamental building blocks of our QSN, and, um, which is just a bunch of Fibonacci chains. And the principle of efficiency of ratios uh, or the more general principle of efficient language states that the fundamental ratios uh, that nature chooses to use uh, are chosen because they allow maximally efficient geometric codes, specifically quasi-crystals. We presented the uh, prominence of the golden ratio in two important natural codes, which is DNA uh, and quasi-crystals uh, and uh, metallic quasi-crystals. Again, this is text from chapter 8 of that book. Uh, again, I recommend you read it because if you want to know about whether our program is interesting, in that one paper we try to stack as much of the clues that were on the right track as possible, so it's a little bit of a variety. Oh, so there's um, a next part, as a and so, clues, so, physical clues. So, okay, so uh, you, Ray's probably going to gloss over this. Oh, um, yes. This is the part you yes. want to skip over, but it could be related to the hydrogen atom. Yes, um, so this is a Rydberg formula in vacuum, uh, fundamental for quantum mechanics, uh, showing the non-associativity. And uh, there is an approximation, uh, 
linking alpha and phi in the literature. If we take this, then we have uh, an interesting expression of uh, this uh, formula. Um, but yes, yeah, this is not the Let's best. Move on, cause yes, we're not, so we're not very proud of this. That's not no. our work. That's some other authors, and no. it's a little. It's not convincing. There is something else interesting in this paper from Petrusevsky, but um, not everything. And uh, uh, yes, this is interesting: the neutrino mixing and the Cabibo angle. This is very strong. Yeah. Uh, contrary to the other, so yeah. <laughs> all the golden ratio are not the same. <laughs> So this one's the uh, first evidence for physics beyond the standard model uh, comes from the experimental neutrino oscillation and the fact that the neutrino will have a mass. Uh, so, and physically, we made an experiment with detection of the solar neutrino. And the, solar, uh, the electron neutrino only are emitted by the sun. Uh, but uh, the det we detect uh, only 30% of them as electron neutrino, and the other are other kind of neutrino, muon neutrino, essentially. So the only way to explain this uh, kind of rotation is to saying that the neutrino has a small mass. So that's therefore upon the standard model, this paper. And this is uh, linked to the... Uh, Ray, can you step back one foot? <coughs> yes to um, a matrix which is si similar to the CMNS, uh, to the, um, yes, this is the CMNS. The? Because the Corvo was also the one who predicted. Anyway, P, ah, PMNS, yes, was the first. Yes. <laughs> Maki Nakao, so no, yeah, yes. Yeah, there is a... Yeah, Contegoro was a pioneer of the neutrino stars. Yes, yes. So this is uh, the mixing between uh, the eigenvalue of the neutrino uh, mass state and the neutrino charge state. So um, there is model, uh, several publications which uh, have made a golden ratio prediction. They are predicting by a model which will be the value of this uh, angle, uh, this coefficient, and then angle. And um, so, yes, uh, this is the explanation. This model uh, includes the algebra and uh, some alternative group of five elements. So that's why, uh, finally, we get the golden ratio here. Uh, it's after, yes. Then uh, uh, the value is uh, theta c, theta cabibo, is uh, 30,88 degree. Can you break that on the board analytically? Uh, yes. Oh, right it's right here, here. Yes, it's here. Arc tangent one over yes. five cube. Yes. Okay. It's uh, arc tangent beta. Right, and then. So this is the Cabibo angle. Uh, so, okay, that, that, uh, so this is the important Lucien result. Hardy. Lucien Hardy result. How, how did he do that? I know that you guys have mentioned Lucien Hardy a lot at the Trinidad Institute. And we're probably going to have to go very fast. So yes, in the book we have all the story. Yeah, and he's measuring <coughs> the simplest relationship between two fermions. So you take the two simplest that you can get your hands on, which is two electrons, yeah. since you can't get two quarks. <laughs> you get two electrons, you move them apart in the same one-dimensional space at the same velocity, and you ask quantum mechanics, what's the probability that they will become in entangled? Oh. And quantum mechanics will tell you that the probability is the golden ratio to the negative five. Yeah, and we have all the detail of yes, the computation, yes. uh, but yeah. I wanted to go fast for the presentation. But this is a very strong uh, appearance of phi in physics, a very yeah, strong clue, very like the Cabibo angle. These two are very powerful, and also the one on the black hole. Uh, Ray, I should, can I cam theory. For the, okay, so you guys, so the, if, if those other authors were correct in suggesting that 
the Kabibo angle is that, an is that golden ratio angle that they suggest, then the Weinberg angle would be this. Yes, we, we have also the development in the... Which is about 29.07 degrees, uh, well within the, the bound. So, uh, Cam, Kolmogorov, Arnold, and Moser theory uh, is, is also uh, an evidence of uh, the golden ratio in physics but it's still difficult to find a paper which uh, clearly explain everything. So we are still investigating. This is a work by very serious physicists, but we don't have the equation uh, where the golden ratio appears. Uh, it's more approximation, but there is many realizations. The KM theorem shows that you can rank um, the probability for measuring a vorticular form in nature and fluid and space-time uh, according to, the, to its irrationality. So if that's true, then it means that um, the most probable vorticular patterns, and they could be traveling vorticular patterns, toroidal patterns, would be the ones that, um, oh, by the way, they, they, I didn't say that the irrationality is, is defined as, uh, or the measure of irrationality <coughs> would be defined by the ratio of the inner part of the torus to the outer part of the torus, mm -hmm. okay? So it's the geometry, the ratios of the torus. So when those are rational numbers, um, KAM theorem shows that they decompose under perturbation uh, quickly, and when they're irrational, they are resistant to perturbations. And then another paper showed that you you can then further subdivide the, the more resistant to perturbation ones with irrational ratios according to their rank of irrationality. Now, I don't know if they cared or whatever, but mathematicians proved long ago that the most irrational number is the golden ratio because you rank the irrationality by how slowly uh, it converges towards its limit. And because in, in the, in, in the, yes, thank you, in the continuous fraction form. And because the continuous fraction form uses only ones, yeah. you, you can kind of intuitively know that it approaches its, uh, can, its limit uh, slower than any other continuous fraction. Therefore, all throughout fluid dynamics of fluidic space-time, water and electromagnetism, wherever you see fluid dynamics and vorticular forms, you should have the highest probability being uh, the golden ratio objects. Think of the ratios of the frequency when you have two cycles on the torus. So if the ratios of that frequency is an irrational number, yeah, the, the, in particular the golden mean, then uh, mm. it will be very difficult to destroy that. Uh, yeah, the hard to destroy. Yes, this is a yeah. physical yeah. evidence, but yeah. 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 there is no mathematical demonstration. Continuous fraction uh, measures uh, the speed at, at which uh, the, the frequencies can mix when you combine higher Fourier components. And so the more it's irrational, yeah. the less the two degree of freedom they can behave like they were a single one. So there's no collective effect. The irrationality defined like that it, it stops the collective effect between the two modes. It is the collective effect that destroys uh, yeah. the periodicity. Just like when you have vibration in a bridge, yeah. it does not stop, the bridge breaks. <laughs> yes. Yeah? It's just as, as simple as that. And so because the golden ratio is the most irrational, from that definition point of view, is the one that uh, where the ratio of the frequency are unmixed the less. And so any perturbation, provided it's not too large, will not break the stability yeah. of the system. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> so now we have the observation of the golden ratio in uh, black hole physics. So that was already in your presentation, Clee? Yeah, it's just we, li we list it because it's not quantum mechanics black hole physics. So you might say, oh, Rovelli discovered the golden ratio in that equation because it's his loop quantum gravity, uh, you know, point of view, and I don't believe in that. But if you just take classic uh, thermodynamics plus 
classic gra uh, general relativity and you do what Davies discovered, you find out uh, in this experiment, which is a thought experiment, <laughs> Uh, that um, that if you if you do this non arbitrary manipulation um, where you set the velocity of the uh, of what, what you what you it's a thought experiment again just like the idea of electron rest mass is a thought experiment physically there can be no electron at rest or is no electron at rest but as a thought experiment it's extremely helpful right to understand what the number would be if it could be at rest. And so similarly, when you do this with this thought experiment that Davies did in the black hole, this non-arbitrary thing in the thought experiment, you find that when m to the 4 over j to the 2 uh, uh, is what it is when, you, when he sets it at that, at that, uh, in that thought experiment, you, you get the golden ratio. Uh, what's the reference here again? Uh, da uh, Paul, Davies. Paul Davies. Paul Davies. So yeah. this is a, 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 it's a fair solution, right? So yes. Same in black hole, I yeah. guess. Yeah. It's yeah. That's right. Yes, mm. it's a care solution, but with a specific constraint uh, linking the momentum uh, yeah. uh, and the mass. There is uh, a, a bunch of Mexican guys, Villanueva company, who have written many papers on mm. black holes and the mm. relationship. There is a page of John Bez also explaining the result. <coughs> yeah. Okay, so, so maybe uh, after you can address, because yeah. I'm interested yeah. in yeah. the yeah. 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 Some reference. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have all the references in the book uh, on this. <coughs> so, and these are the two equations uh, from the first part. So this is the uh, equation from uh, Carlo Rovelli. Uh, when you take the logarithm of both sides, you the you wrote down, right? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, so this, uh, this is the lower bound of black hole entropy from uh, Carlo Rovelli, 1996, in this paper. Uh, and uh, this is uh, what we have derived uh, with Marcello, which is a very simple formula, 2 to the power pi gamma equals phi, and gamma is the immersive parameter. This is what was explained in the first part. And uh, I let uh, Cli uh, <laughs> conclude. <laughs> uh, not much of a conclusion to say other than um, this paper, we basically tried to pick um, four or five um, reasonably logical uh, arguments where experimentally from other people's work like Carlo Rovelli's and from these particle physicists, where the golden ratio shows up. We don't care much that it shows up in plants or architecture or, you know, because that is not convincing. What's convincing is when it shows up in Carlo Rovelli's black hole physics and it shows up in really fundamental things like the KAM theorem and general, generalizable things. Um, and so the idea of the paper that I sent today to Carlo Rovelli and to Lee Smolin, or the, the book, is that if you just take all five of our clues that we stack and you consider all of them as a package and then you consider the approach of doing a new form of loop quantum gravity where you get your, gra you, you don't do it on a graph, you do it on a drawing of a graph, a real moduli space and you get your moduli space from E8. If you do that, you're probably uh, at least on a good fresh path that nobody else has done and it has it's just logical it might fail but it's logical and it's supported by these circumstantial evidences of the golden ratio showing up